In today's video, we're focusing on how to use Cursor, a developer-focused AI Power IDE. This video is meant for beginners, but I'm also going to be sharing a few advanced tips to help more advanced developers. So if you're using Vue, React, Python, C Sharp, Unreal, Unity, or any other framework or game engine, then this video is for you. But honestly, you're probably here because you would like to answer a very important question. And that is, can Cursor really speed up your development process? Well, I am very excited to have you join me in finding out, since we're gonna be putting Cursor to work by adding new features to a mixed reality application that I previously created to demonstrate how hand tracking micro gestures work on a Quest device. All right, guys, to get started, let's first go to Cursor.com and sign up for a new account. If you have an existing one, just log in. Then you will see two plan options available, the Pro version or the Ultra version, which essentially provides higher limits. Now let's download the installer. Cursor is available for multiple operating systems, so pick the one that you need and then start the installation. Click on this file to launch the setup and click on finish when it is complete. Okay, so when it opens up, just authenticate by using your existing account. And similarly to VS Code, you'll get a chance to select a team. Also, a few important shortcuts are shown, which we're gonna be using a lot today. Click on continue and review the language and terminal cursor settings. All right, guys, so now we need to open up the actual project that we're gonna be working with. In my case, I'm using a micro gesture demo that I built for XR. But if you notice, right now we can basically select the file and as soon as I start typing, we can't really get the full support of the base language, which in my case, I need that for C Sharp, but if you're using Python or any other programming language, just make sure that you install the base language support, which is going to give you that autocomplete features that we really love and it also makes developing a lot easier. So now that you have it installed, since I'm using C Sharp, I'm also going to be needing the .NET SDK runtime. So I'm just gonna get that installed and now if I type, you're gonna see that now we have full context and information about what's available from a mono behavior class. So in your case with Python, with React, you're also going to get access to what is available. So this is good to go now. If we look at the extensions, they are ready to go. So you get full search support and it's really fast. That's some of the things that I really like about the IDE. We can select different items. I can also get the Git support, which is a source control integration available. Again, this is basically a fork or is being you know ported over from VS Code. So you're gonna have a lot of those features available here. So on the terminal side, you can also use the chat features, which is the AI features that allow you to basically build commands for the terminal by using natural language. So in my case, I wanna say, show me all the folders only in this directory, and you're gonna see that the command gets generated, which is actually a pretty ingenious idea to be able to use AI to generate the commands, because you know sometimes we don't remember all of them. So yeah, when I started developing, we didn't have this, so seeing this right now, it's actually pretty, pretty crazy how much the AI features have advanced what we can do with not only the terminal, but also with coding, which is what I'm gonna show you today. So you can see here, I can see all the different images available in the directory. And that's, you know, that was generated from me asking AI to do that. And then here I can also use PowerShell. So I wanted to test to see if we can also get the output of what PowerShell would expect. And it is context aware, so it knows that I'm using PowerShell in this instance. So now we're gonna be focusing on the chat feature, which you can toggle by pressing Control L on Windows or Command L from your Mac. So if you look in here, we can select the context. And by default, when you do this, it's going to select the current class. I can also go back and clear the context or add a file as a context. There's multiple options in there. I can also select whether I want to ask a question. I want to select an aging mode. And in this case, I'm gonna use ask because I just wanna ask a question to AI. And then this area here, Ado is going to select the model that works best for whatever you're doing. I would choose to do that instead of actually selecting one unless you really know what you're doing. Then we also have different settings in here for chat. You can select 
the size, you can also determine what models we want to use. They even have Grog and different GPTs, so you can you know, dive in and really enable the models depending on what you need. So what I'm gonna do now though, is I'm gonna go ahead and select everything in here. I'm gonna do my command or control L command, and you're gonna see that it's gonna add the line numbers. I can also tell it to explain you know, the code that I have right now. This is basically the code that handles the changes of an image gallery by using micro gestures for a virtual reality game. So you can see here what it's doing, which is really, really cool. If I don't know the project, this is gonna be very helpful. I can also see you know, where is this loading images from. So I am pulling, in this case, in this code, from the current resources folder, which is a very common place to put resources that are available locally in Unity. I can also look at the gestures that I am listening to, the position tracking, enlargement mode, which basically enhances and makes the image that I have selected larger, and it explains that in here. So what I'm gonna do is let's go ahead and actually select a method, and let's see if we can refactor this method by just selecting the lines within that method, and then we're gonna tell it to, instead of explaining what it's doing, I'm actually going to, actually, let's go ahead and have it explain what it's doing, but it's gonna keep it in this context. And then after this, we're gonna be basically refactoring, but you can see the response here is basically based on the code that I selected, which is really, really cool and powerful. So what I'm gonna do for the refactoring part is we're gonna do that on a new chat, which is gonna be on the very bottom. And I'm gonna say, can you refactor the body of each one of the if statements that I have in here. I know that these could be refactored, so let's see what AI is going to do for us. And right now it's generating the code, and again, I am in ask mode, so it's not going to apply any changes unless I tell it to do so, which is really handy, right? You don't want AI to make changes for you unless you really want to. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say apply to this class, and you're gonna see that everything in red is what I had before, and then everything that is not red and that is pending either a reject or an accept. Those are the things that I'm going to be able to go through and make sure that they are correct. I wasn't really, you know, trusting this, so I wanted to make sure that I, you know, I was going through every single one of these lines, and most likely you wanna do that, right, in your Git. You wanna make sure that AI is not doing crazy changes. Again, it's not super, super uh, smart. Well, it is smart, but it's not, like, it's not always gonna be perfect because it, it is all based on how you ask questions, so I would recommend to make sure that you are reviewing everything. So this is what I'm gonna do right now, is I'm gonna look at side to side what I had before, what I have now, I like the method names, I like what it did with the code, so in this case, I think this was pretty successful. So if we go back to using the terminal, you're gonna see that now I can use, like I showed you in the beginning, natural code to basically add the changes that I have to get, so in this case, it's adding that for me, I know him by memory, but if I didn't know git commands, this will be very, very helpful. So in this case, I'm gonna say, you know what? Just commit it and then add it. I know there's an error with this code, but let's just go ahead and type the commit name. The NN is going to be incorrect in this syntax because I'm using PowerShell, so it needs to be semicolon. So I'm just gonna tell AI that this is not working. And you can see that as soon as I tell it to do that, is going to regenerate, it's gonna add it, and it's gonna push it. So now let's go ahead and test it by deploying to my Quest 3 device. It looks like everything is working. I can change the image by using micro gestures. I can swipe left, right, forward, and then go back. And I know that this was working before and it looks to be working now as well. Let's go ahead and actually use AJ mode, which is what I have selected now to make changes as I am going to be asking questions. So in this case, I want to basically add a new feature that is going to allow us to fade out and fade in the image that is selected. And I could go ahead and code it myself, right? But what if I had AI, which you know can help us with that process? So in this case, I asked for a fade in and out effect. And it's gonna show you the process, right? It's writing all this code. Once it's ready to apply the changes, it's going to show you the changes that are pending. If I didn't like this, I could reject it, but looks like everything looks good so far. You can also look through the explanations. And it's really, really fascinating that 
you know, we can actually do this nowadays. I don't think I'm going to stop saying that. But anyways, you can look at the explanations, read them, look at what the code is actually doing. It created a code routine in this case. You can customize the values from the fade in and fade out. It even decided to do the fade out duration to be lower. I can also look in here and accept the changes for the core routine that it created, which is fine. I think that works fine. You can see the changes here that remove that line and that makes sense because it's not going to be animating and replacing the center image sprite at the point where it needs to do that, right? It needs to animate. We need to wait for that to happen. So you can see here the current color, the elapsed time calculation. If it reaches that, it's basically going to do a fade out and then it's going to do a fade in and apply the color to 100% once it's completed. Now we can test it and see if it's working. Looks like it's working and this is pretty crazy. I mean, this is a simple example, but just imagine what we could do with the power of AI and the features that we have with Cursor. Okay, so the next thing that I want to do is I want to just go ahead and clean out my code, right? Like, are there anything in here that I don't want to use or maybe I just I'm not using. So I wanted to go through the scripts folder and determine if I have any unused variables. So, I mean, you can go through it and the, the actual output, the console will tell you what is not used. Linter will tell you what is not used, but you can also use AI to do that. So in this case, I'm not using the big increment of variable. This is a variable that I introduced because I was going to be adding an additional feature, but I found it, I removed it, looks like it's, you know, it's good to go. So this line is also not used, so I'm going to go ahead and remove it. So this next feature is called inline edit, and it's really cool because it allows you to make changes in line. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select these two different methods. We're going to be pressing Command K, or in Windows, you can do that with Control K. And we're going to be basically specifying a prompt. In this case, I want to add a minimum and a maximum limit on how far or close I can bring the gallery panel. And as you can see, as soon as I hit enter, it's going to make the modifications. I also have the auto or ask if I wanted to change that. So in this case, you can see the code looks great. It did what I asked it for. It still has some hard coding elements, such as the 0.5 value, but we're going to be changing that later on. So. The other thing that I want to do, though, is I want to make some renames. And yes, you can make it with the IDE by using the rename feature. But I can also be lazy and tell AI to make those changes for me. I want to be able to move these variables to the very top. I don't want to use them in this area because that's really not standard. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the tab feature, which is going to be doing a prediction of what I need. And you can see that it auto completed everything that I needed. OK, so what I'm going to do now is I want these values, the 0.5 value to be basically a variable on the very top. So I'm going to tell the chat here that that's what I want to do. So let's go ahead and see what it did. It created a new gallery movement distance. I'm going to accept the changes. I like the name. And then you can see here at the very top that that was added. So there's one logic change that I want to make to that code, and that is that I want to hide the parent component by default. That panel that we just added, I don't want it to display unless I am basically hitting a limit. So if I get the panel too close to me or it's too far from me, beyond the value that we are specifying in the gallery movement distance, then we're going to be displaying that. I also want to clear it out. So this logic right here, it's going to basically handle that. And I'm going to show you how that works. So what it did, it added a new game object, which is called the error label parent. You can see right now on the screen, that's what AI added. You can also see here, like if it's not null, it's going to set it to inactive in different sections of the code. And then at the very bottom here, it's also going to activate it only when we hit the limit. And that's OK, but I don't really like the way that it was implemented because it added a new game object that I have to specify through the inspector. So what I'm going to tell it in here is instead of introducing a new variable, a new serializable field, I want the system to basically use the error label text mesh pro object to basically find its parent. And based on the parent, we can tell the parent to either hide or show itself instead of us introducing a new component, again, that we need to connect through the inspector. 
So it looks like it's going through the process and it's going to make those changes. And this is really cool, right? Because we can see what it's doing. So you can see here the results. It's now accessing the parent of that game object instead of having to connect that through the inspector. So this is a lot cleaner. And I still want to make some more changes to it because I don't like how it's checking for nulls on the parent and also on the label. And okay, so now what I'm going to do though is let's go ahead and select the error label and also the null check on the parent. And you can see here, I want to add a is gallery error label valid method or property. And you can see here that I told it to add a new property that basically has the same logic. That way it's more explicit. It's a lot easier to understand when you're reading the code. And the results of that is basically this private Boolean property, which is exactly what I was looking to generate. So now let's check the results. You can see that now it displays the panel. If we have the gallery area too close to us, everything is working. I can swipe. I can actually move it further away from us. And also when we hit the limit, the panel is showing correctly. So far we have been implementing features in an existing file, which is the image gallery UI. And we're going to be doing that again. I want to emit whenever I'm changing an image and also when I'm hitting a limit. It generated the code correctly. I have an on image change event on limit reach. And if we look at the actual code, it's actually pretty good. You can see that on each one of the methods that we're going to be targeting, there is an invoke. It invokes that action. It passes the current index of the image that gets selected. Also, if we're reaching basically a limit, we're also going to be invoking that event. In that way, the image gallery audio listener, which is a new file that AI generated, can actually hook into those events. So if you look at the actual listener in here, the binder, the logic is basically going to bind to the events that get exposed through the image gallery UI. We're getting that UI component in here. You can see that we're adding listeners for that and also loading the different audio clips that we have in the file system. And on destroy, it's trying to keep things clean. On image change events are actually playing sound. So this is really, really cool and really powerful that I was able to add all those features without me having to code anything from scratch. But again, just make sure that you're going through the code. So just in this case, I had the system actually rename the file because I didn't really like what I call it originally. And AI also can do that for you. It's going to require that you expose additional permissions. But once you hit accept, it's going to make those file changes. And if you look at the results of this, you can now hear the sound effects. And that's because we now have the audio binder that is binding to the events that get emitted from our image gallery UI class. All right, guys, so this feature is really cool. If you go to cursor.com agents, this is really, really powerful because once you authenticate, once you install cursor into your own repo, the way that it's going to work is going to run a background process of whatever it is that you want to create. If you want to optimize your game, if you want to add a new feature, Basically, this is going to have the sufficient permissions to execute those tasks. In my case, I want to optimize the micro gesture repo. So I'm going to let it run and see what it's going to do. And in the optimization, it's going to give you basically the review of what it needs to do to optimize that repo. Again, these are recommendations, but it's really powerful because it's not only going to tell you what it thinks that it needs to do, but it's also going to generate all the code and create a PR for you, which is really, really cool. And something that I'm still thinking about it because it's mind blowing and it's going to be very helpful. Well, I'm going to be honest, that was pretty scary, but trust me, I'm saying this in a very good way. I've been using AI, but nothing like this. I can see the benefits to speed up development, just like you saw today when we added new features to an existing application. But it also scares me for entry level developers that may just rely on AI to code and never truly learn. So as a takeaway, use it with responsibility type your own code. Don't let these tools do all the work for you. All right, I am curious if you're using Cursor or a similar tool today. If so, comment below. Also subscribe and hit the notification bell as I'm going to be experimenting more with Cursor and also bring you new XR development videos very soon. Happy XR coding, everyone. Thank you.